Since I posted my video about the Millennium Tower issues about three weeks ago, and you can see that video here, there have been additional developments reported in the news. I'll discuss these new developments, but more importantly, I want to give an overview of the comments that I received on that video and kind of delve into the various opinions that were, were provided by the viewers. When I did that last video, my goal was to present the key facts associated with the whole history of the project, from its initial design to construction, as well as the remediation to address the excessive building, settlement, and tilt. One of the more prevalent reactions was that the original piling design that involved approximately a thousand pile that only went down to about 80 feet below grade to a sand layer should clearly have gone all the way to bedrock. Uh, given a building of this size, this importance, you know, the original construction was over $350 million. Now with the repair, they're in at over $500 million. And there's still a lot of uncertainty regarding the future performance of this building, both from static and dynamic loading conditions. All these ongoing problems could have easily been avoided had the developer just spent an additional $5 million having the pile go all the way to bedrock to begin with. You know, I mentioned in that last video that ASCE issued a report evaluating the history of the settlement and tilting problems of the building, and they really didn't address what I think were glaring oversight in terms of design. You know, why did they think they could put such a big building on a relatively shallow pile supported foundation and not expect excessive settlements? How could they expect that no one would dewater, remove water as part of an excavation at the adjacent developments. Unfortunately, we don't have good answers to that. You can clearly read between the lines, but people are focused on trying to salvage this half a billion dollar investment to this point. Another big theme in the comments section was that many of you thought that this building would not likely perform very well in the event of a major earthquake. Because of the heterogeneous foundation type, you've got piling all the way to bedrock on one side of the building, piling considerably shorter for the rest of the building. Just a lot of key elements to this design that raises a lot of questions about how well this is likely to perform. Some of you said that you personally wouldn't live in the Millennium Tower due to concerns about how the building will perform during an earthquake or just because of the ongoing saga of continued foundation settlement and associated building tilt. And another thing I wanna to touch on is, I think there's a lot of distrust and perhaps rightly so, given the history of this project. Another point that I didn't address in my video, but as some of you pointed out in the comments, there's already been issues associated with serviceability of the building. Apparently there's elevators associated with a parking garage that can't be used because of excessive building tilt. You've had instances of raw sewage backing up through people's sinks. Again, this is related to the building tilt. You know, these lawsuits were recently settled, which produced the money for these repairs. As I mentioned, this partial repair involved 18 pile. Originally, the proposal was to install 54 piling around the full perimeter of the building with the pile extending to bedrock. But as they started installing these pile, the amount of foundation settlement and building tilt started to accelerate. This appears to have been caused by removal of soil material during the installation of the piling. So they regrouped and decided to install only 18 pile along the perimeter of the building that had the most settlement. That ended up costing $150 million when originally the entire repair with 54 piling was estimated to cost $150 million. So after the lawsuits were settled, the condo association said, hey, we're not gonna be coming back to you unit owners for more money. Well, that went out the window. In August, they sent out letters, according to the media reports, demanding additional $10 per square foot. So the size of these units ranged from around 660 square feet to around 5,400 square feet. So it's a, it's a lot of money. If you owned a penthouse unit, you'd be seeing a bill of around $52,000. And these bills were due October 1st of this year. And as I mentioned, the serviceability problems, uh, this has already caused some people to move out of the building. I mean, who wants to pay this kind of money, have sewage come up through their kitchen sink, and then get hit with an extra bill of $14,000. These sorts of occurrences are gonna really push people out of the building and likely depress the value of these units. Personally, I don't see how the residents should be expected to pay any of these costs to address the problems associated with the original building design and construction. But you've probably read enough stories about how condo associations work, and it's pretty common that these extra costs, whether it's a replacement of a roof prematurely or other structural issues, the owners of the building units end up getting stuck with significant bills in most cases. Others have posed a question about the insurability of these units. I found this article, and I'll put a link in the video description. It was written by an insurance agent who indicates there's likely to be no insurance coverage for the unit owners in the event that the Millennium Tower Condo Association or city officials 
determined that the building could no longer be occupied due to safety concerns. So this brings me to what I think is the most important theme about the whole episode involving this building project. And that is the difficulty in any of the parties involved being able to trust each other. So for example, the condo association saying, hey, we'll recover enough money from the lawsuit, we're good. And then turns around and issues a bill to these tenants for additional money. To cover $6.8 million, which is just a portion of the cost overruns associated with this partial repair. And how about the design engineer associated with this partial repair? As I mentioned, the original plan was to install 54 pile around the perimeter of the building at an estimated cost of $150 million. They quickly ran into unexpected problems with increased building settlement and tilt, such that they had to regroup. There was extra monitoring and surveillance costs and, and coordination with the city. And the cost of that partial repair quickly ballooned to $150 million for only 18 pile. They also said that with the installation of these 18 pile, a significant portion of the building tilt would be rectified. Unfortunately, to this point, only a small amount of building tilt has been recovered. Now, it's this same engineering firm who's provided assurances that this partial repair has made the building safer with regard to seismic events, earthquake loading, than the original construction. Quite frankly, I find that hard to believe. If you put all these issues together, the common theme in the comments was that people can't understand why it's acceptable to have this level of risk because of the uncertainties and the potential consequences of a failure of this building. Accordingly, many of you said that this building should be condemned, the residents moved out, and the building removed. That way it no longer poses a threat to anybody in the building, near the building, or even just to passers-by on the sidewalks and streets below. But I think a more likely scenario relative to the future of this building will be due to economic loss. There's at least 16 units for sale right now with the average price of about $1.5 million. And it looks to me like there's even more units available for sale than there was even three weeks ago. So what does that mean if the values continue to drop, if people aren't able to sell their units? I think it could get to the point where the economic situation is that people won't want to continue seeing decreases in their property values. They don't want to risk getting future massive repair bills in tens of thousands of dollar range. So it all hinges on the ongoing monitoring and what happens with this building foundation, as well as the tilt of the building. So again, I think this is one of the more fascinating stories in the country, if not the world right now, relative to a large residential structure. And you've got just so many players involved, got probably significant cost uh, fallacy really driving this. If somebody spent a half a billion dollars and you have residents, hundreds of residents in the building who would probably like to stay there given everything that's going on. They may not be able to unload their units without taking a significant loss economically, or they may just like it and not be concerned themselves about the future performance of this building. So you have a lot of competing interests. You have the city who wants to raise money based on property taxes. There's a whole host of issues here. While all this is going on, it's, it's happening against a backdrop of many portions of downtown San Francisco hollowing out in terms of retail pulling out, uh, commercial office space being underutilized. So to me, it's a pretty amazing situation. And I think what's particularly interesting to me as a geotechnical engineer is how all these problems started with the issues associated with the original design. And to me, that raises questions about how good is a lot of areas of engineering practice these days? I can really only address the area of deep foundation design and installation because that's what I specialize in. And I can tell you, I am shocked at the poor pile design that I commonly see on a variety of projects. Issues with piling that have plan tip elevations of maybe a foot or two above bedrock, where you could be assured of getting required capacity by extending the pile to bedrock, let alone the additional 140, 150 feet that was required at the Millennium Tower to extend the piling to bedrock. I see people use wrong types of pile sections using H pile, where they more appropriately use pipe pile, or they use open into pipe pile, where they should use closed into pipe pile. It's just uh, surprising to me. I, I don't know what to make of it. I think it could be that things are becoming very specialized, very compartmentalized. And I think unfortunately, fewer and fewer engineers in practice have that much field experience that, that they can relate to the design work. So if I was encouraging any of you young engineers out there in terms of the progress of your career, I would make sure I get a good mix of field and design work. And when I say field work, part of on-site investigations, geotechnical investigations, whether it's conventional drilling and sampling, geophysical surveys, but more importantly, get experience during the construction phase. 
Get experience in seeing how piles are installed. How shallow foundations are constructed. How dewatering is performed. What happens when dewatering is performed. What things on a site cause settlement, whether it's placement of fills or widespread dewatering. All these things could become invaluable to you as a design engineer in the future. Well, thanks for joining me on this update to this fascinating story. I'll continue to monitor the situation and provide updates going forward. I'll also have upcoming videos on a variety of geotechnical and civil engineering projects, so be sure to hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons. Thanks very much.